welcome to this event. Um, yes, thank you so much to everyone who's taken time to organize this uh, auspicious event, uh, starting from uh, the Hibakusha stories and the filmmakers uh, for their leadership and alongside APPNW. I know a lot of work has gone into this. And thank you to all of you for joining. And um, I look forward to having a wonderful time together. As many of you know that we're here uh, right now today to remember the victims and survivors of the horrors unleashed on the citizens of Hiroshima and Nagasaki on uh, in 1945, August 6th and 9th. And we're also here to strengthen our um, desire or resolve to uh, help in the burning and elimination of nuclear weapons. And this ultimate goal is now within our reach. The, in 2017, the UN adopted the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, and this represents our best hope and opportunity to answer the appeal of the Hibakusha for never again. That is ensuring that these instruments of mass destruction are never used again, whether by design, by accident, or by miscalculation. So, um, I know and, uh, we have uh, some of the Hibakusha here with us and the number are not here with us, but as we mark um, 76 years since uh, this uh, time, so sad, sad period, I'd like to call for a minute of silence to just remember the victims of the bombing at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And um, now I think with that, we are good to start this event. And uh, before we start, I'd like to request all of us to kindly mute our microphones while not uh, making a contribution and um, to let the microphone remain muted throughout the event and to remember to unmute it whenever uh, we'd like to make a comment. Um, it's also important to note that this meeting is being recorded and, li and live streamed. So if uh, you wouldn't like to have your photo in the live stream, then uh, kindly turn off your camera. And there will be time for questions towards the end of the event, but you can still put on questions that come up in your mind in the chat and they'll be brought up. So I'd now like to call upon Michi Takeuchi and Susan Streckler to make rem remarks about the the vow, the, the the film, the vow. Welcome very much, uh, Michi and Susan. Hi, Sally. Thank you so much, and thanks everybody for attending, um, and for giving us a platform to show our film to this important audience. Um, when we started uh, making the film in 2015, there were four things that. Uh, we were focusing on. Uh, of course, Setsuko's life and how she grew over the years into the global figure and force that she is now for nuclear, nuclear disarmament. Also that year, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty was uh, meeting, which only uh, meets every five years, so we were focusing on that. It was the uh, year of the 70th anniversary and also Setsuko and the Hibakusha had been nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize. But as we began to dig into the background of the movement, which at that point, I must be honest, I didn't know that much about, uh, we began to understand more deeply the story that we were going to tell. And that's when we began to see how crucial doctors have been to the movement the International Red Cross, Red Crescent, 
IPPNW, of course, which is founded by Ira Helfand, who's in our film, and uh, Tillman Roth, and Doctors for Social Responsibility, and on and on. And at that point, uh, that's when we realized how meaningful the role of Michi's grandfather, who was the first, uh, among the first medical professionals who had to deal with the horrors of a, the, the um, you know, of what happened when a nuclear weapon was, was dropped, uh, how to deal with that crisis and how much that story fit into the story that we were gonna tell. And now I'm gonna let Michi continue with that. Thank you. Well, first of all, good morning, everyone. And I am so moved and touched to be with you. Please don't tell anybody, but if I can choose, any organization that I really love the most, except Hibakusha Stories, is IPPNW. I'm a fan. First of all, I came into this movement rather later in my life, thanks to Setsuko san and Catherine san I'm going to talk about more like my personal story as a background. I grew up, I'm from Hiroshima and uh, I, my family survived the atomic bomb. I grew up in a very medical family. I love doctors. My grandfather was a military surgeon. He was at the uh, severe uh, war front in China at the time of China-Japan war in 1930s. And then he came to Hiroshima to head the Red Cross Hospital. Then here's my father, who was an onco oncological surgeon. Then I have three brothers who are all doctors. I'm really trying to promote at least one of my brothers who join IPP and W. Give me some time. And I can say, growing up, I was surrounded by doctors. As I, I recall, my parents, when I was a little girl, my parents used to host the doctor's study meetings at our home in Hiroshima. And the meeting discussion was followed by dinner and friendly, active drinking. Eight to 10 doctors were at my, at my home every month. And uh, they spent a few hours discussing seriously. As a young child, I was so excited about all these cool doctors coming to my home. It seemed like such a special occasion. I was in and out of the room, even though I was discouraged not to disturb the meeting. Later in my life, I learned that these are the meetings where the doctors got together to exchange information about what they encountered with the patient's various symptoms. We are talking about 1960s. They are gathering the information as they were treating patients in Hiroshima. Of course, many of the patients survived the atomic bomb. Some of these doctors were also personally very dedicated for helping Hibakusha. Yes, they, wa they were activists. One of them, Dr. Toratarō Kawamura, he, the, he was a physician, financed Hibakusha from Korea to come to Hiroshima. After the war was over, a number of forced Koreans who had to live in Japan went back to Korea where there is no special treatment in relation to radiation of the atomic bombs. So Dr. Kawamura invited these Korean survivors, let them stay in his practice for free and treated them for over the years for free. There, is an, there was another doctor, Dr. Tommy Harada. He was a surgeon who was in charge of Hiroshima Maidens project. He chose and sent off the severely burned and disfigured young women 
to get more advanced plastic surgery in the United States. It's quite a well-known project. He also founded World Friendship Center with an American Quaker woman whose name was Barbara Reynolds, a drop-in community center where foreigners can, could go and visit to find out about what has happened in Hiroshima and have opportunity to ex exchange opinions between Hiroshima natives and foreign visitors. As you can see, doctors have been so critical in both understanding and advancing uh, treatment of Hibakusha. I was so lucky to be surrounded by these doctors who are like my uncles, and uh, we used to go up and mount climbing together and so on. And yet my point here is that I had no idea. These nice men, at that time, these are all men, unfortunately to say, but these are the men who are really helping patients because they needed to treat them. And today I am with you young medical professionals, we really need you to carry on the legacy and important work doctors do. And I want to cheer you on and also I like to work to be a part of your movement. Thank you so much for watching our film and I, I can't wait to hear what you thought about it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michi, for those nice words. And um, I know we're going to take questions later on. So I'll move our program further on. And let me start by saying that today we are honored to be joined by a Hibakusha and activist uh, whom most of us know, Setsuko Thalo. And, um, uh, she survived the atomic bombing of Hiroshima 76 years ago. She's here with us. And of note is that uh, just one week ago, she was honored uh, with the naming of a new breed, a new variety of the rose flower. So uh, the flower is actually named after her, Setsuko Thalo Rose, and it's a rose of hope. And um, this is actually... Uh, this will actually be displayed um, in next month. That is when it will be displayed. It's a rose that does not wither. So yes. Um, so this, it, it was cultivated by Matilde Ferrer, a breeder, a world renowned breeder and president of the Spanish Rose Society. And he describes this rose, the Setsuko Thalo rose as beautiful, multicolored rose, delicate in appearance yet resilient. So basically describing what Setsuko Thalo is. And um, yes, it, its leaves do not wither throughout the year. So I think this is remarkable. Congratulations, Setsuko. And we are so happy to have you here. And now I'd like to give you this opportunity to share your remarks with us. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, I just don't know how to express fully my sense of gratitude for your interest in the issue we are fighting for and to take time to get together, spend moments to support each other and then keep on pushing once again. I am delighted we are working with the younger generation, it's wonderful to feel they are capable, committed younger people there to pick up torches from many of us who are getting a bit tired and a bit weak. So thank you for being here this morning. Um, I don't know where to start. 
uh, I am almost 90 and reaching the end of my life, I suppose. And a few days ago, we observed the Hiroshima Day, 75th anniversary of Hiroshima Day. Today is Nagasaki Day. Time is passing. Sometimes you're so busy, you forget the passing of time, but it has taken so many years. I think it's important sometimes to stop running to and set the stock of our activities in life. Well, maybe I can take short time to explain so many of the factors, of course, in my life, which affected uh, my life. But of course, as you can imagine, my encounter of a nuclear weapon, um, 70, six years ago, that definitely did changed my whole life. I'll give you a bit of my experience. I was a 13 year old junior high student. And in those days we had no academic um, program in classrooms. We were all mobilized to do the work for the army, for the government. And um, we were about a group of about 30 girls were selected and trained and to work as a, um, decoding assistant for the army. So I was at the headquarters building on that very day, the building which was about one mile, um, one mile, yeah. 1.8 kilometer away from the hypocenter. And at eight o'clock, and uh, we started the morning uh, assembly, and the major was giving us the pep talk. The girls, this is a day you should prove your sense of loyalty to the emperor and be a good citizen, or something like that. We said, Yes, sir, we will. At that second, I did see the the bluish white flash. It was like a magnesium flash. And uh, that second I felt that my body was floating up in the air and that is the end of my memories. When I regained my consciousness, I found myself in total darkness and total silence. And I tried to move my body, but I couldn't. So I knew I was pinned under the collapsed building. So I knew I was faced death. It's in deflection. I, I still don't understand why I remained so calm. I was so serene and just facing death. Maybe neurologists could explain, I suppose, um, what was happening in my brain. And psychologists talk about psychic numbing. Maybe something happened bodily, physically, because I wasn't feeling anything, calmly accepting death. But then I started hearing faint voices, classmates saying, God help me, mother help me. Then all of a sudden, somebody started shaking my left shoulder from behind and said, don't give up, don't give up. See the light coming through that opening. Move toward that way, keep moving, keep kicking, keep pushing. I'm trying to free you. And that's what we both did. And I was able to get out of that rubble. And as I looked back and I saw the building already on fire. So I remembered my friend in that second, but there was no way I could enter back into that burning building. So beside myself, there were two other girls who managed to come out. And the world I saw was something I can't fully describe, but it was morning, 8.15, but when I came out, it was like twilight. It was so dark, perhaps because of the, oh, the, the smoke and, and the particles in the air, 
which was rising up together with the mushroom cloud. And that prevented the sun and light. And that must have affected the lightness or darkness of the outside. Uh, then um, I started seeing some moving objects uh, near me and that they certainly didn't look like human beings. They were like ghosts and the people's skin and the flesh were hanging from the hands. They raised their hands above the lung and they were slowly shuffling from the center of the city. And um, they were just burned, black and swollen and they collapsed in the middle. And then the soldier said, you girls, you join that procession and escape to the nearby hill. We did. And learning how to jump over the dead bodies. And at the foot of that hill uh, was a large military training ground about the size of two, foot, two football fields. But by the time we got there, the place was packed with dead bodies, dying people, injured people. But you know, it was the strangest thing. It was so quiet, calm. You would expect in a chaotic situation like that, you would hear people screaming and shouting for help. No, that's not what I remember. The only thing I heard was just a faint begging voices. Give me water, give me water. Everybody was asking for water. After all, their body has been um, scorched and, uh, by 4,000 degrees Celsius. I, I understand that's the, the degree of the heat on the ground level. We wanted to be helpful because our injury was uh, light, but we had no cups and buckets to carry the water. So we girls went to the nearby stream and washed off all the blood. And um, we just tore off the blouses and soaked them in the cold water. And then we dashed back and put it over the mouth of dying people. And uh, they, <laughs> they just uh, sucked in them, the moisture from the wet cloth. They looked at you and said, thank you. And then one by one, and they, after they had the drink or something, why they all passed away. Anyway, that's what we girls did all day. I quickly look around in the square at the training ground where thousands of thousand people were dying, but I didn't see one single medical doctor or nurse. Later on, I learned that about 80% of all the uh, doctors were killed themselves, but the remaining doctors must have been working somewhere else, not where I was. That meant those suffering people had no water, and no medication, no care by the professionals. It's just the people who didn't know what to do, but we just responded to their basic needs, which was what. Anyway, that's the way we spend the daytime when the darkness fell. We girls sat down on the hill and looked down the burning city all night, feeling numbed from the massive death we had encountered during the day. There was no anxiety or panic. Oh, what's happening to my house, my parents or anything. No, we remained so calm. That was my psychological state. And that's an interesting challenging issue. I know one American um, psychiatrist did the study how the psyche uh, protects human being uh, in the ultimate situation like that. 
Dr. Jane Lifton, some of you may have read his book, Death in Life. Uh, he spent half a year in Hiroshima, interviewed the survivors and um, listened to their stories. And uh, he said he made them many helpful, uh, well, he presented many helpful ideas. And one of the things he talked about, about this psychic numbing and the ultimate condition, how human beings behave, how they feel. Well, he talked about the cessation of emotional responses, appropriate emotional responses. We just stop feeling. And that applies to my own memory because for a long time I suffered. What kind of heartless human being am I? I watched my own sister and her four-year-old child being cremated in such a um, primitive way, you know, in the ground, the soldier dug up and their bodies were thrown in, gasoline poured, the lighted match was thrown and they kept turning their bodies with the bamboo poles and saying, hey, stomach is okay, but the brain is not what, and burnt yet. They made the cruel and the remarks like that. There I was, 13 year old child just standing without any emotional responses. I just watched it. So memory of that, troubled me for a long time. I accused myself, I am heartless. I didn't even shed tears. But later on, Dr. Lifton's uh, contribution of ideas uh, was very helpful. Anyway, I'll come back to my story. And uh, on the 7th, the morning of the 7th, and uh, they were, crowds of people at the mountain and the soldiers said, is there Setsuko Nakamura? Is there Setsuko Nakamura? Your parents coming. I was surprised and they somehow found me. They heard from other people that I was at army headquarters. So I must be with the soldiers and so on. Anyway, I was reunited with them and I learned and my sister I just mentioned and her child were just really almost close to death and they were uh, resting at the nearby uh, summer house of my relatives. So uh, next day, I joined my sister and a four years old boy and for several days, we tried to care them but with nothing and they kept begging the water as they did, yeah, like everybody else. And by the time we had to give some water to that little boy, somehow his face was so disfigured and it was hard to open his mouth. Somehow forcefully we opened his mouth and tried to give a bit of fluid uh, anyway, no medication, no, nothing. At least they had the loving family around, but tens of thousands of people just abandoned their families and relatives, were searching their loved ones somewhere, but they never met. Anyway, actually, I lost a total of nine members of my family, closest relatives, two uncles, two aunts, two cousins, my sister, sister-in-law and nephew. I told you about my sister and nephew who were so bad, badly burned and they lived several days. But my uncle, who was outside of the city, so he and his wife survived. We rejoiced the news. But then several days later, 
I heard that they were developing purple spots all over their body. So after my sister died, my parents went to my uncle's place and took care for them. And according to my mother, um, their, their internal organs seemed to be rotten and coming out as a thick black liquid or fluid. So they do, they use everything to use as a diapers until they died. We didn't know this condition uh, was caused by the radiation. Nobody knew, even the doctors didn't know what was causing this kind of condition. And some people had fever and the doctor thought, well, maybe this is scarlet fever. So it took some time before we learned what we actually happened, how to cope with this crisis situation. Um, yes, my sister-in-law uh, was a high school teacher. And at, on that day, about seven to 8,000 grade seven and eight students from all the high schools of the city were brought together to the center of the city in order to do some physical labor to clear the destroyed rubbles. Um, the city was getting ready for eventual big air attack by the Americans. So they destroyed houses and somebody have to clear it. So they used the students as the cheap laborers. And so seven to 8,000 students were there. My sister-in-law was there um, supervising the students. And I learned later on, by the time that fireball came down to the ground level, the degree of the heat, of course, was reduced from millions of degrees coming down on the ground level where people were living about three to 4,000 degrees Celsius. That kind of heat simply vaporized, you know, incinerated. So from my own high school, 351 people were there. They were all practically killed instantly. One of them survived, my best friend. So she came back to school later on and told us what the situation was like before other girls died. Of course, everybody was just burned, black and disfigured, and they could hardly see each other because their face was just uh, disfigured. But by their voice, they could identify, like this was Miss Sando, Miss Tanaka. And the math teacher said, well, come on girls, let's be together. So people just crawl in the muddy, and then they came together and they wanted to sing him together. And it breaks my heart when I heard this story and when I remember it, they chose their favorite hymn. Here, um, nearer to thee, my God, I come or something like that. It still is my favorite. Well, they thought of it, that's what they sang together. And then math teachers said, the girls who can walk, come with me. Let's walk to the nearby Red Cross Hospital. And those who have trouble hung on, on my shoulder. So Miss Muramoto stood up and put her arm on the shoulder of Miss Yone Kura, Yonehara. And she reported to us that moment, the flesh and skin just came out, came off and she could see the white bone, the shoulder bone of the teacher. Well, they got to the hospital. I didn't know that was a hospital which his grandfather was uh, lying down with his own injuries, but they got, 
they got there and Miss Yonehara stayed there for several days, a few days uh, here. But of course, hospital was destroyed and the people lying down, not just in beds, but on the floor everywhere. And I hear she just lied down on the ground in the garden. But they got some care. They're doing better than others in the other part of the city. Uh, what else can I tell you? But uh, in the aftermath, the girls who are burned badly were so disfigured and um, they looked rather unsightly to say the least. And um, heartless kids said, oh, you are obake, you are ghost. So those girls just helped hid themselves somewhere in the house or something. They didn't want to go in the public to be ridiculed and laughed at. My own church minister knew this reality and uh, he worked with uh, Norman Cousins and uh, John Hersey, those people in New York. They uh, created the wonderful program and 25 girls were selected and they were brought to New York to Mount Sinai Hospital and with the support of Quaker people. Uh, they spent several months, I think, and to get the plastic surgery. So they were very fortunate to get that. Uh, well, thank you, American friends in New York area for your support. Not only the girls who benefited, but the rest of us benefited to know there were caring friends, even in the so-called enemy country. People were not enemies, nation to nation, did such cruel thing to humanity. Um, anyway, what I started telling you was about social discrimination which against survivors because of the ugliness and uh, and survivors are tired, very well, not energetic. So people started calling they are lazy bunch. Of course, that affect their employment and all that. And. Uh, and with the ugly sights on the scars on the faces, the young girls in the marriageable ages, they were so broken hearted because that meant the no chance of happy marriage. That was a real issue. Um, and I can't speak detail of the medical uh, problem, but I do remember that the, there was total lack of medicine and the knowledge of how to deal with the victim of the nuclear uh, warfare. The doctors had to just take a chance to do better. You know, so when we heard that the United States was going to establish some kind of medical setting in Hiroshima. And the ABCC, we called it, uh, Atomic Bomb Casualties Commission. They built the same thing in Nagasaki too. So they thought, oh, we're going, finally, we're going to get some kind of medication. They were happy. But soon we, we were disappointed the sole purpose of that American agency was to study the effective effect of radiation on human bodies, but not to treat people. Well, you can imagine how the survivors felt. They thought, well, once again, we're being used as a guinea pig. The way they use us for the bombing itself indiscriminate attack on innocent citizens. They were not combatant. 
they had really nothing to do with a war planning or anything, but United States consciously chose down that location of attack. They didn't want to drop the bomb during the night when people were sleeping. They wanted to use it during the daytime when people were busy to get to their work and schools. People are mobile, busy on the street. And those information comes from the, um, well, there are lots like uh, activities of interim committee or targeting committees and so on. And the President Truman had several key people around him. You know, you know, when I speak in the States, the students ask me, are you still angry at Americans? My response is, no, I have no reason to be angry at people. They were in the dark like the rest of the world as far as Manhattan Project was, as far as this planning for the mass killing, how, how to kill, how effectively to kill, how to use that result to prepare for future war. All this kind of planning went with a small group of people. We, I and many other people consider that was a crime against humanity. So I make it clear to the student, no, people, not people, but those who planned for such inhumanity, inhumane mass massacre atrocity, that is something to be remembered. But we don't remain angry. Well, everybody felt pain and sadness and anger and, but when, you know, we go through the emotional intellectual process, no point in the angry, just would, that would be the, you know, repetition, and this going the circle of hate, that doesn't solve any human problem. We have to go beyond that. And that feeling of anger can be, can be generated into uh, new energy, creative, powerful energy to change the evil from this world. So I don't feel embarrassed about talking about it. Yes, I was hungry. That was my honest human response. And I encourage other survivors, don't be shy when you go to stage, when they ask those questions, be honest. Anger is a natural human feeling. If you had it, say so. But you didn't remain. You came out of it. You are driven to do the work to make sure nobody else would ever go through that experience again. Anyway. Um, anyway, let me talk about the turning point for me to really go into public. Um, I finished high school and went to university for four years. And at the age of 22, I graduated from university and I had the opportunity to receive the scholarship to study in the United States. It's because I was so impressed by the remarkable work my church minister was doing and uh, helping the people like uh, the Hiroshima Maiden I just mentioned and helping with the 5,000 orphans, the kids who were relocated out of the city to protect themselves. They were living in a mountain at the Shinto shrine or Buddhist temple and so on because everybody anticipated imminent attack by American B-29. That's the name for the, the largest flying fortress, they called it. 
And the war ended. And so soldiers were coming back to Japan. And Japan had already, Japan was defeated, it surrendered, and Japan was under the occupation of Allied forces, mainly by the US. In that chaotic situation, one my own minister, one of those people who were providing leadership to organize the care for the families with a father, the orphans, and um, the people injured who are not having any medical care. Anyway, I was, as a teenager, I was so impressed by uh, selfless adults around me who were dedicated for the new lives of the citizen. So I wanted to be like him. I wanted to be like other people, helpful, giving people around me. I wanted to become a social worker. The president of the college I graduated from, who is a graduate of Columbia University in New York, she knew what the situation was. She said, if you want to, if you choose social work, you know, the United States is a good place. They have a good educational program. And go and get the training, come back to Hiroshima. We need you. Now we are living in democracy, no longer in military totalitarian society. Woman has a place in society. So you come back and help to get the woman become active in the city. And very uh, helpful advice she gave me. So I came to the States and that was 1954. If you remember what was happening at that time, United States had started testing hydrogen bomb, a lot more destructive bomb than atomic bomb. And then finally, I think it was March 1st, I think in 1945, they tested the largest hydrogen bomb at the Bikini Atoll in the South Pacific, Marshall Islands in the Pacific. And this news really upset the entire nation of Japan. They were angry, people were angry. Not just Hiroshima, not just Nagasaki. Now, United States is after the people of Marshall Islands. Enough is enough, this has to stop. The entire nation woke up. And you know, that was the beginning of the birth of the largest social movement recorded in the history of Japan. And that was what was happening in, during the springtime, 1945. And that was the time I graduated from university. I was coming to the United States. I was not exactly totally prepared, I suppose, in that climate. As soon as I got to the States, press people interviewed me and said, what is your opinion? How do you feel about what's happening in Japan, bikini and so on? And uh, fresh out of the college, naively, I gave my honest feeling that has to stop. United States should not be preparing for future nuclear war by testing. Testing means developing new weapon. That was 1954. That's what we were talking about the need for stopping the testing at that time. Anyway, that happened. And uh, starting next morning, I started getting unsigned hate letters. How dare you? Remember where you are. Remember who gave you scholarship. Go home. That was the beginning of the traumatic week. I just arrived from Japan after spending two weeks sailing the Pacific Ocean, if, which was not easy. I was seasick. So I was suffering from this all the time. But anyway, I was excited and happy to come to a new world and uh, I had a great anticipation of learning, making friends, but I was told to go home. I was frightened, really. 
What, are they, what am I going to do? I can't go back. How do I survive in this society? I had to do soul searching. Professor was kind. They gave the house to myself all day. I was living in a dormitory, but then they thought it could be too dangerous. I couldn't attend the classes. So I was alone in the professor's empty house. Oh, that was the loneliest time. I have to make up my mind how to live. I was alone. I had no one to consult with. In the reflection, I admire myself. Somehow I reached a very good conclusion. I thought, well, if I stop talking about my experience of atomic bombing, who else is going to do that? It is my moral responsibility. I can't pretend I know nothing about it. I do know something about it, how the weapon affects human body and soul and the community that have to stop. So that was really the turning point for me. But also I responded to the invitation. I spoke here and there. So, 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 so. Okay, okay, all right. Um, anyway, that was the beginning of my activism. And so I went to Virginia. That's where I spent a year. And my husband-to-be came back from Canada and joined me. We got married in Washington, D.C. and um, entered into Canada. And I did summer study at the University of Toronto. Then after that, I went back to Japan, did some practice of social work and teaching and so on, together with my husband. And I had two, two babies. Of course, having baby caused anxiety because many women who were in the city at that time had uh, you know, um, babies with a developmental delay mental retardation and so on. So the woman, uh, people avoided the woman who were in that city. And they said, well, don't, they said to their sons, don't marry those girls. They would have the deformed baby. So that was another reason for, yes, I realized in the shortness of time, I will stop that, but, uh, that's part of my life story. And um, I had a great time of learning. I found American people busy just uh, justifying their government's behavior. It was not easy to work with people like that, to live in that society. But things started changing and we have people like you and many other people I remember the day million people walked in Manhattan in New York and they all said, never again, no more nuclear weapon. So that's where we are. So let's keep on. I know I get tired too from time to time, but we just can't afford to give this up. We did achieve the first milestone. We now have that treaty which said, Weapon, those nuclear weapons are illegal, not just immoral. They are illegal. We have to get rid of that. Let's keep working. Sorry, I took a long time. So when I start talking, I keep on. <laughs> okay, that's it. We'll talk some more later on. Thank you so much, Setsuko. That is indeed so moving. Um, Listening to your story, I mean, it always feels like it's a new story, you know, when you listen to it again. And I'm sure it's quite motivating for many of us, and especially the young doctors and, uh, and medical students who are here. And um, I'd like to hear a few remarks from the medical students to uh, 
know what uh, they they had they had time to watch the film so to get to understand what they feel about the film and um, what their remarks and the feedback from your story so I'll start with Shoki Shoki if you're around um, maybe you, yeah maybe you can let us know what um, the film meant to you as a Japanese medical student um, okay so hello everyone I'm Shoki Hamada. I'm very honored to be here today. So uh, your question is, what did this film mean to me? Yes, uh, this movie uh, meant me a uh, mindset of the health. So in other words, uh, this, mean, uh, this movie teaches me uh, pieces uh, best prevention for people's health. Um, as a medical student, uh, we learn the importance of disease prevention, but uh, we don't learn the importance of peace. So thanks to this movie, uh, I can reconfirm that um, it's too late to help people after atomic bomb exploding. So after watching this movie, I thought I would like to spread this idea to more medical students through uh, IBP and act activities. Yeah, this is my answer. Yeah, thank you for that. And um, maybe you can let us know how medical students in Japan are keeping alive the memory of the Hibakusha and um, their plea for a, nu a nuclear uh, weapon-free world. And um, are there any strategies you're using to amplify the voices of the survivors? Uh, for example, stories, such moving stories uh, as what we've just heard from Setsuko. Um, what are you doing as medical students to keep this memory alive and to use this to keep campaigning for uh, world free from nuclear weapons? So, um, thank you for question. So the first one is, um, we have two activities to keep the memory alive. The first one is uh, to deliver the voices of Kibaksha directly. Uh, we, we can use the PeaceNet project system um, that provides face-to-face -face, uh, interactive communication with Hibakusha through the online meeting that is supported by Nagasaki National Peace Memorial Hall. We used this system in Mongolia in 2019 summer. Uh, that is one thing. And the second thing is to seek uh, to speak Hibakusha's memory by ourselves. And this is a training project for the successor to the atomic bomb experience. It aims to convey the fear of nuclear weapons and the desire for peace to prosperity. And this is supported by Hiroshima National Peace Memorial Hall and one of our members involved in this training now. These are our activities to keep memory alive. And uh, the second question is how we can amplify the voices of survivors. Yes, uh, the question, the answer is, I think sharing this movie is one way to let people know about the facts, but to advance our cause more, um, I think it's uh, so important to discuss, especially among young people. Uh, because some young people are pessimistic about the world without nuclear weapons. The reason is, um, they don't image the future without nuclear weapons. And also they don't think how to build uh, peace after eliminating 
nuclear weapons. So I think uh, it is more important to discuss together with young people rather than um, unilaterally imposing facts on them. So I think um, our mission of IPPNW students will be to engage in dialogue with young people um, as, as much as possible. Yeah, those are my answers. Thank you, Shoki. That's uh, quite interesting to hear your thoughts about this. And um, thank you so much for joining. Thank you so much for all the work that you're doing uh, as a medical student in Japan. And um, we you. can hear from a few more. Yes, we can hear from a few more medical students. Ulfat. Yes, Ulfat, if you're here. I'd really like to, yes, I'd really like to hear your thoughts. Um, I'm sure most of us would on your responsibilities as uh, medical students in connection to nuclear weapons abolition. Yeah, many people, many young people, as uh, Shoki said, find it difficult uh, to relate to this issue. So what do you think are the roles and responsibilities of you and the other medical students in connection to nuclear weapons abolition? Uh, first of all, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak on this great platform. A very good evening to all of you. Myself, Ulfat Pardesi, and I'm the ISR of IPPNW. I'm fortunate that I'm sharing a common platform with the Nobel laureate, Sesku Tarlo Ma'am, the lady who has sacrificed so many things in her life for abolition of nuclear weapons, the lady who is an inspiration to everyone, including me. Coming back to the question, today I am going to speak about the action that can be taken by students around the world towards the abolition of nuclear weapons. Students are the future of this world. They are the most important asset that we have today. One in four percent of our population is youth, which means that they are going to play a significant role in global peace and development. According to me, I have jotted down five E which can help to involve students in uh, nuclear war abolition. That is expose, educate, engage, empower, and e-connect. Talking about the first E, that is expose. In a matter of years, the students will be the leaders, policy makers, and the citizens of responsible citizens of the country. It is very important for a country having young demographic population to expose them to the reality of nuclear weapons to make them understand and realize that nuclear weapons are the real threat it can cause damage and destruction, which is irreparable. The medical students can very well understand that in addition to the immense loss of life, nuclear weapon can cause long-term damage to the planet, weakens those exposed, contaminates environment, and long-term health consequences, including cancer and genetic damage along with destruction of economy leading to poverty and famine. Thus, engagement of all citizens is necessary as it is a shared responsibility. But these days, unfortunately, we do not expose our youth to the reality or even to the rudimentary aspects of peace and international securities and its impact on living world. Hence, exposing them is of utmost importance. Talking about the second E, that is educate. Generally speaking, most students uh, know relatively little about nuclear weapons and nuclear war. Schools and university curriculum barely touch this world-changing weapons and their consequences. This gap in the education of today's students poses a problem. They should be taught from the early age about the detrimental effect of nuclear war. And nuclear weapons always leaves a threat to the general population. They should be taught about how the nuclear weapons devastate the environment, cause significant threat of terrorism, creates hazardous waste, usage of non-renewable resources, and direct costs attributed to nuclear weapons program. The third E is engage. Youth are the greatest power of all of us together, which has great potential, great energy, and great insight. The current trend of youth is being very active on social media. 
and this needs to be channelized by diverting their energy towards national integration and building of pluralistic society by involving them in peace promoting activities. The students should be engaged in global grassroots network and allied organization to advocate for abolition of nuclear weapons and its replacement with peace and development. But we are failing somewhere to engage them to prioritize and sensitize to complex challenges of nuclear war abolition. And we should promote worldwide students' engagement to debunk the myths of war and to advocate for a nonviolent and culture of peace. The fourth E is empower. The world is facing several challenges to its security. As on date, there are globally hundreds of sub-conventional threats to all countries than even before, as they are closely intervened. Coming closer to Asia with highest number of nuclear weapons, with developing countries like India, Pakistan, China, and adding the complex nature of developing and under, underdeveloped countries with its vast illiteracy, multiplying population, poverty, and massive in a, enormous unemployment, during this pandemic, countries are not able to control conflicts around. Youth can actually participate in nation building. They should be empowered by including them in policy making at various economic, social, and political level. Here, the students can come out with their ideas, capabilities, and connections. The students should be empowered by providing platform and opportunities for the inclusive growth and give them their due recognition. Thus, we still have so much to develop and bring in peace and sensitize our society, especially the fellow youth with me to such stress and manifestation. Talking about the last E, that is E-Connect. Given the current reality and institution by few people, group of people, even including political parties, all such actions are highly detrimental to international well-being and security. Under such circumstances, it will not be out of place to give them serious thoughts to pro promote awareness among students about the global peace challenges through eConnect. The youth should be connected globally under a common digital platform common to all over the world by which we can achieve uniformity in imparting instructions and prevent misuse of youth innocence. The youth can organize engrossing and interactive workshops on international security and integration and team up against nuclear weapons and nuclear war and can work towards global peace and development by integration, strength of diversity, leadership, team spirit, team building activity, and much more and gear up towards a better world to live in together. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much, Ulfat. I think uh, that is very impressive. Um, I'm here thinking it's actually quite a good summary, the five E's and should probably be somewhere in a poster presentation. Maybe, I mean, your question should have come last, but I'm sure we still have uh, great thoughts from the rest. Uh, Franca, yes, Franca from Germany. Yes, hello. Yes, yes. Um, the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons entered into force in January of this year. So, um, and uh, although it's being largely ignored and undermined by nuclear weapon states and allies, uh, it's one treaty that is uh, meant to change international norms. How do you think European activists are using this um, treaty to advocate for a nuclear weapon free world? And are you getting involved as medical students in using the TPNW to advocate for abolition of nuclear weapons? Um, yeah, thank you very much, Sally. And thanks to all of you uh, to invite, for inviting me to this event as well. And thank you all for it and uh, Shoki for your answers um, that just came before me. Um, I think all for many of your points and also what Choki mentioned are very important. I come back to them later. But uh, talking about the first point of your question, Sally, how the TPNW is used in Europe, um, I think you first have to remind the special situation in Europe, which is that we have two nuclear weapon states, France and the UK, as well as, well as three states who are um, in the nuclear sharing, which means that they are hosting US weapons on their soil. And for example, in Germany, German soldiers are practicing the use of these weapons. So um, although we are geographically a very small continent, we have uh, quite a, a big amount of nuclear weapons here. 
um, and then of course in Russia as well. But the nuclear sharing um, is basically um, a topic that is not very well known in Germany at least and in many other European countries as well. Um, so we are really trying to push this into the agenda of the different political parties. Um, in Germany, we have the national elections coming up in September and we are trying to make this a point of discussion because all, yeah, every uh, country is actually uh, investing in the modernization of these weapons. And one way how we do this is, uh, with, for example, the peace camp in um, Bücher, that's the uh, US air base where the weapons are based. And uh, it's a protest camp, uh, which happens every year, organized by young students. It's very diverse. And as Setsuko mentioned earlier, I think it's the creative energy and way of protesting that is presented there. And it's really welcoming to many other uh, people and it's growing every year. But we don't only do this in Germany at the airbase, but trying also to connect the airbase in the, the Dutch airbase in Volkel and the Belgium airbase, uh, where US weapons are um, positioned as well. We're trying to do this by bike tours, which is a, uh, has come a traditional way of protesting for many other PNW members. But again, these bike tours are meant to raise awareness among the ordinary society by cycling through just villages that are very close to the air bases and that have somehow maybe become, become used to um, this special, special situation that they are living in with nuclear weapons being so close to them. And we're trying to talk to people on the way and do protests and demonstrations at the air base as well as on the way. Um, these bike tours will take place this year as well and have taken place last year, uh, even in Corona times, we managed to organize that. And then um, this is also all uh, in, a, yeah, in line with one of the uh, pan-European campaigns, which is No Nukes in Europe. And they basically have a very simple um, idea, which is uh, summarized in three points. Points. First of all, end the modernization of these weapons, which I said is already taking place in many countries, and then end the nuclear sharing, and finally sign and ratify the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. So this is basically the strategy we are pushing to. Um, in Germany, for example, we are also trying to um, get the government to join the uh, first meeting of states party, which, which is scheduled um, early 2020, 2022 in Vienna. Um, and we're trying to push the German government to join the treaty, not at a, as a state's party, but as an observer. Um, and also many other European IPPNW uh, groups are trying to do this. At the same time, um, for at least Germany, the, the moment of signing the treaty is still far into future, I must say, but um, we're trying to make them at least work on some articles of the treaty, for example, the victim assistance article, and uh, make them, yeah, remediation, um, make them, uh, yeah, help the victims and recognize the victims of uranium mining, which has taken place in Eastern Germany for quite many years. So there are different act activities, um, some of them being very political, some of them are taking place on the streets, um, but medical students can definitely get involved and are getting involved. As I said, the protest camps at the airbase are mainly organized by young medical students, but also from other fields. And um, I think very much in line with what um, Olfat has sum summarized so greatly. The first thing, or one of the first things that's always very important um, is to educate young students. Because as also Shoki said, I think it's our duty, but our, also our right to have an opinion on this. And it can be, the nuclear weapon topic can be quite an intimidating topic. And so people, young students, first of all, have to get some self-confidence on this topic, to then build their own opinion and speak up um, to the great, to the uh, decision makers. Um, for example, in Germany, we have a Nukipedia, which is a weekend of, uh, yeah, an educational weekend, where we get trained um, to become ambassadors. Um, and this is something that can be transformed and also used with the film. Um, I think we talked about this earlier, 
that alongside with the film, The Vow, uh, there has been some training material being developed. And I think this is a great thing to be shared. Watch the film, get into touch with the topic, um, and then educate yourself. Yeah. And then, of course, we have, um, yeah, different activities on the international level as well. Uh, I think you can follow and get an idea about the different um, events that are hosted by IPPNW IPP by following us on the social media channels, as Ilford said, eConnect. And um, of course, not only eConnect, but also on the local level, try to connect with different students and make this topic more public and more, um, yeah, raise, it, raise awareness about this topic because it's something that young people don't talk about because it's somehow history to them, but it's really not, as I said, all the nuclear weapons uh, countries are uh, modernizing their um, arsenals. And it's an ongoing threat that we are living in and it's getting more complicated, as Olfart said, the conflicts are rising with the COVID pandemic, the climate crisis, it's, it's all getting even da more dangerous. So stay in touch with your local IPPNW chapter or make your own, uh, not only within IPPNW, but also with your medical faculty and other medical associations that you're working in. For example, the RFMSA for students or the World Medical Association for young doctors. And also within these organizations, the topic needs to be raised. And we've done this um, somehow successfully, but I think it can be very much improved within the IFMSA. We've developed uh, seminars there and uh, did workshops on the topic, but um, it just has to get more attention. And then um, there are different, also different possibilities to, to uh, raise awareness very practically. We have the, uh, this idea of using a target X project where you somehow simulate a nuclear attack on campus, for example, or in your city. Uh, we have um, uh, a guideline how to organize this event um, with your local student group. It's not very hard and can be quite effective. And then, of course, there are other campaigns that you can just join. Uh, for example, the divestment campaign from ICANN, Don't Bank on the Bomb. Check your university investments, uh, the investments of your university, whether they invest in uh, nuclear weapon development or your bank account or your uh, on the state level. And then, of course, get your local uh, government to sign the treaty uh, with the ICANN Cities Appeal. Um, uh, symbolically. Um, we have quite a few cities in Germany and all over Europe who have already signed the treaty symbolically and somehow thereby pressured the national government um, to uh, sign the treaty eventually. Um, so these are some ideas that I'll um, be happy to share um, and they can all be found on the IPPNW website or on the ICANN website and I'm happy to, to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Franca. Indeed, uh, those are also very important remarks. Yes, it's good that you've emphasized on education and I hope that uh, the more experienced people uh, hearing this from the medical students, maybe we could consider uh, coming up with an education package that is specific to the needs of young doctors and medical students. Uh, listening to you, Franca, I, I just remembered a few years ago when IPPNW decided to engage me and uh, they challenged me to offer a speech in one of the Congresses on, on the Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And yes, I had to go back to educate because I didn't know much. So I really, really had to dig through history books and yes, it was quite a challenge. It's indeed a very, very big gap. And I hope that this is something that can be addressed. Indeed, it's important to educate and engage and empower as it is coming out. And now we can move to the two largest nuclear weapon states, the US and Russia, and listen to medical students from these two countries, uh, Katerina and Joe. If you're here with us, we'd like to hear from you and uh, have a feel of what you think. Uh, do you have a special responsibility um, in working towards a nuclear weapon free world in your countries? Um, yes, as medical students in, this, in, in Russia and US, what do you think is your responsibility in this campaign? 
Okay, can I start? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ekaterina Shilkanovtseva. I'm Russian students representative of IPPNW. And uh, I'm happy to be here with all of you. That's an incredible meeting that can uh, play in an important role uh, in our peaceful world. Uh, I was born in Bryansk. It's a small city in Russia, and uh, the location of this city is nearby uh, the place of Chernobyl disaster. And uh, I have known uh, about awful consequences uh, of radiation um, from my childhood. And uh, the powers of uh, nature are not in uh, themselves good and devil. And uh, how we use them uh, depends uh, on uh, only the person. As doctors, uh, we cannot keep silent uh, about nuclear weapons uh, because uh, our professional duty is to protect uh, life on our planet. And uh, the story of Hiroshima shows uh, the suffering uh, faced by survivors uh, of nuclear weapons. Uh, and uh, we all know the irreversibility of radiation, but uh, we haven't got any ways uh, how to treat them. And um, it's a huge risk uh, for our humanity. As a citizen of one of the largest uh, nuclear states, um, I can definitely say that we made uh, the first big step in 1985, and we should uh, promote uh, our movement uh, and uh, do our best for amplification. And uh, young generation uh, surely uh, should be brought up uh, with uh, their idea uh, of peaceful world. All the students should understand the danger and um, consciously approach the problem. And uh, we have Russian section of IPPNW and we have started officially formalizing our community at uh, Sechnev University. Uh, their strategy of peaceful peaceful coexistence and uh, collaboration uh, must be deepened uh, in every way. And uh, we must convince uh, each uh, generation that we can everything together. And uh, all our humanity creates, our humanity can and will control. And we should be a big team in our peaceful world. Thank you. Jor, you are the next one. Hi, uh, yes. Um, so uh, first of all, I wanted to uh, thank um, uh, IPPNW for uh, convening this event and also thank you to Setsuko and Michi and Susan for the film, which I watched yesterday and which was incredible. Um, it was it was great to learn more about um, Setsuko's story and Michi's family, uh, as well as to see some of the footage of the, the drama unfolding at the uh, at the UN uh, a couple of years ago. Um, uh, so I, I um, was a medical student a few short years ago. I'm now uh, a uh, staff hospitalist at Mass General Hospital and a, a lecturer, a uh, instructor at Harvard Medical School. Um, and um, uh, I, I also wanted to uh, say I'm grateful to be able to recognize um, uh, Nagasaki Day and the uh, the um, victims and survivors of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings um, today. Um, in terms of the question of um, uh, the special responsibility of the U.S. and Russia, I think that's absolutely right. Uh, uh, between um, our two countries, we uh, possess 90% of the nuclear weapons. And I think it's also important to comment on the ways in which the United States uh, alone has a special responsibility on this issue. Um, uh, my country is the only one to have ever used nuclear weapons, um, uh, uh, although other countries, of course, have uh, um, uh, tested them with with terrible consequences, um, and also I think it's important that um, you know the, the folks in the United States don't often realize the position of of strength and really hegemony that the uh, United States is entering negotiations from. Uh, we spend more uh, on our military than the next ten countries combined, 
we uh, encircle our perceived adversaries with 800 military bases. Um, and, and then paradoxically, uh, you know, we live in a country where the, the cost of political activism is actually quite low compared to some of the nuclear weapon states um, and uh, the influence of glass, grassroots activism uh, on policy um, uh, can be quite high. Um, and so, so I think uh, for all these reasons, we have a special responsibility in this country. Um, in terms of uh, what we can do, I'm really humbled by the uh, accomplishments um, of, of the other folks on this call and, um, uh, you know, all of the things that, um, that the other folks have mentioned, um, uh, Ulfat's uh, um, framework and, and uh, all the details from uh, uh, Franca as well. Um, so uh, I guess a few thoughts to outline. Um, uh, you know, this kind of citizen to citizen and doctor to doctor diplomacy is crucial. It bypasses a lot of the, uh, um, the issues uh, that our governments face when they talk to each other um, uh, and sets a, sets a trajectory for them. Um, I think uh, we all uh, have work that we have to do and are doing in our own countries, um, advancing legislation, educating the public, um, educating our me medical communities and, and students in our own countries, I think. Um, as, as various folks mentioned, um, our uh, school curricula around uh, nuclear weapons um, and the history there are, are, are pretty lacking in, in terms of their, their coverage of the issues. Um, uh, as various folks mentioned, the, um, the, the face of activism has changed in recent decades. Um, I think we need to, uh, uh, as Ulfat said, uh, work, work on uh, how we're engaging on social media and new media and, and ways of communication. And then finally, I think, you know, seeing the way that the pandemic has unfolded, especially in my country, recognizing that, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, uh, it, um, rejection of rationality and um, difficulty with, um, you know, wishful thinking about uh, ignoring facts. And so we have to recognize that when we're communicating, um, with people, uh, there's a limit to dumping facts on data on them, and uh, and we have to kind of become better storytellers. Um, and and so I think uh, one of the things that, that's so incredible about um, you know being able to share this plat platform with Setsuko Thurlow is is uh, her incredible storytelling ability, and we all we can all learn from. Thank you so much. Um... Joe for that, and Katerina as well. Um, I think we are running out of time, but um, maybe we can get a question or two from the audience. A question to, a question about the remarks we've gotten from students, from Setsuko, uh, from Michi, and from Susan, uh, and uh, uh, from the young doctors as well, like Joe. Any questions from the audience? Yes, I have a question. Uh, hi, my name is Jim Wagner. I'm an activist in Maryland in the United States. And um, so I think central to try to change things. Um, okay, so let me back up and say the reason that <clears throat> our country is so uh, militaristic is that uh, war is profitable. We have a, a system you may have heard of that we in the field use a lot. It's called the military industrial congressional complex. So uh, we have a lot of weapons contractors and uh, the government pays big money for the weapons and the contractors employ a lot of people and so the Congress uh, women and men are uh, very beholden to the contractors because uh, their constituents will lose their jobs and their businesses if the government doesn't continue to buy their product. Um, so my question is, does anyone have any ideas about how we can make peace profitable? Uh, in the same vein that war is profitable. Um, short of changing our economic system at this point, which actually is in desperate need of changing, I think that offers hope 
or at least an important avenue for us to consider. Uh, and I've unfortunately just started thinking about it, but um, perhaps you young people uh, have some ideas. Thanks. Okay, anyone who can respond to that? How can we make peace profitable in the same way war is viewed as profitable? Any remarks from any of the speakers or anyone from the audience? Charles Johnson has his hand up. Yes, Chuck, please. I just have a, this, this that's a very, I mean, I, I'm sure that that this issue is is very central and, and it's good that he brought it up. It's not something that we talk about or think about a lot. One of the things that made me hopeful in this last election cycle, and that I hope catches fire at some point in the United States, and maybe will be considered in other places, was the whole linking of the what was called the Green New Deal, addressing the climate issue by spending money in areas that that uh, replace CO2, create jobs in those areas, um, and partially funded uh, originally uh, as envisioned by Senator Bernie Sanders when he was running for president with uh, reductions in military spending. So I think there needs to be discussion of how we spend money uh, in, the, in our various countries uh, for a positive good. And that needs to be part of our conversation that we have with people against nuclear weapons and militarism that there are better ways to spend that money uh, in our societies. And so um, I think that's an important part of it. Uh, Kathleen Sullivan has listed in terms of uh, trying to get governments and large uh, uh, investment groups to divest from the weapons makers and thereby make them less profitable in that way as well and influence those companies to begin to uh, develop other products <laughs> that are not so destructive to humanity. So that's uh, my quick answer and thank you. Thank you so much, Chuck, for that. And I'll just read out a question from uh, Lachlan Foro. And he asks, how can those of us who are early APPNW medical students most effectively support you and your efforts? So, I'm thinking this means support uh, medical students and young doctors in our efforts and basically all activists, how can they support us? Um, what do you think? Maybe um, Shoki and Franca, what do you think about this? So we have some of the older IPPNW students, very early students asking how can they support us in our work as medical students and young doctors? Shall I start, Shoki? Yes, Franca. Yes, yes, um, you can. I think that's a very good question. And um, thanks for the offer of supporting us. And uh, one of the best ways I uh, personally think to do it is to share your experiences, and to share your own stories, because you have faced questions in your life that we are facing now very practical ones regarding time management and how to deal with the extra work that you want to do, but uh, is sometimes very hard to do next to your job in the hospital or your medical studies. Um, but also questions uh, how to connect this, um, your personal engagement and your activism with your profession and how to deal with some maybe skepticism by colleagues or patients even. And of course, the world has changed and we are living in a different world now. We are working differently. But I think you have maybe gained some answers um, to the questions that we are, have, that we are having now. And um, we, uh, one project that we are trying to do as well in Germany is uh, to gather questions from students that they are facing and to post them to the older generation of IPPNW um, members to, to get some inspiration from them 
Um, I think that's very, uh, very important point. And uh, maybe I have also another point to the question before, but maybe we can run through this first and then if possible. Oh, can I talk a little bit? Uh, yes. Yeah, I, I also think uh, connecting to uh, senior members is so important. So in Japan, especially in Japan, uh, we now we uh, have the opportunity to interview to the uh, elderly members to know more uh, about their past activities. So I think that is uh, one concrete um, activity we can do. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Shoki. And I can see that uh, Joe has his hand up. Joe, please. I just wanted to recognize in terms of, uh, uh, I know Lachlan, you're asking that question uh, partly as a, uh, uh, as a uh, senior uh, uh, doctor, uh, academic doctor. Um, and uh, I know that I'm very grateful for folks in positions of power in the medical academy who um, recognize the fact that outside of patient care, like this is what I do and that giving me the recognition, recognition, taking that seriously, the recognition that that's, that that's, you know, legitimate, you know, giving me the space to do that, um, uh, uh, you know, is, is, um, is not something that I take for granted. Yeah, thank you so much for those responses. And I think now in the interest of time, unfortunately, or fortunately, because we'll have uh, other opportunities to keep engaging, we have to end this meeting. So I'd like to thank you all for joining, for taking your time, for your comments and remarks. Thank you so much to the speakers for sharing their insight with us. And um, next week, uh, sorry, not next week, but in September, second week of September, there'll be an international student meeting, IPPNW student meeting. And uh, I think this is a good introduction to the same. So we're all invited to join in and support them and learn some more in case of any uh, questions, any additional questions, maybe we can email them to Molly if you can share your email address with, with us. And uh, Molly is also going to send uh, documents that will be helpful to us, including the link on where we can view, for those of us who haven't viewed the, the film, uh, yeah, view the film at, uh, during um, our own time. So I'd like to thank you all once more and hope that we'll be able to interact more in future. Thank you so much and um, the meeting is, is over now. Thank you. <laughs>